Uh, hi everyone. Uh, hope you are enjoying the first week. Uh, so, bef before I start, are there any questions? Anything about the class? Anybody wants to ask? Uh, okay. Uh, so let me start with a few announcements. So first is that quizzes are on grade scope. They will be released every lecture by 7 p.m. roughly and due by the next lecture. And the first quiz uh, deadline is not today, special case. Uh, it's tomorrow 5 p.m. So you have a little more time for the first quiz. Uh, <clears throat> as you might already know, uh, the website has most of the information including homeworks uh, and other places to check are ed and grade scope so you might want to make sure you read the ed posts uh, regularly maybe set up email forwarding there um, lecture notes and videos so uh, for every lecture uh, lecture notes will be posted and videos will be uploaded uh, by the weekend like uh, not necessarily immediately after the lecture, but, but by, by the weekend after the lecture, uh, right. And homework zero is already up on the website. It's due next Thursday. It's due next Thursday and uh, it's very simple. It's basically just to get you set up with the, some basic probability, uh, basic programming Python and uh, the compression, Stanford compression library that we have been, uh, that we will use for fu future homeworks and project. Okay, so if you are good, let's get started. Uh, right. <clears throat> okay, so last time we considered a source with four symbols, A, B, C, D. With very, very skewed probability distribution. And, and we talked about how a fixed length code would require two bits per symbol because you would do like 0, 0, 0, 0001011, 1, 0, 1, 1, which, which we felt was not, not the best just because A and B have most of the probability and you would expect to use one bit per symbol or close to one bit per symbol rather than two bits per symbol. So, so, so we had, we, we tried something new. We tried variable length coding and this is the code we, sorry, CX. So C stands for code word. And we wrote down the lengths. Uh, one, two, three, three, right. <clears throat> so I asked a question last time. I, I gave an input sequence and, and the encoding of that sequence. And I asked, how would you decode it? If somebody wrote it down, can, can you tell me the, uh, the input sequence and the encoding? Anybody, yeah, if, if anybody who wrote it last time. Good work, okay, <laughs> once again. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we had A, B, D, C, D. A, B, D, C, D, and we encoded this to A was 0, B is 1, 0, C is 1, 1, 0, sorry, D, D is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, okay. <clears throat> and, and I asked, how would you go back? How can you go back from this encoding back to this? Does anybody have ideas? This. Yes. So, so uh, can you walk through roughly like how it? Okay. So zero. Okay. So very good. So if it's zero, you you see only one code word starts with zero. So that must be an A. Okay. Yes. If, if now there's another zero, so it has to be a distribution where there's two. So if there was another one, then it's like another distribution where there's two. 
Yes. <coughs> so, so what we are doing here is we start with zero. We see that only one code word starts with zero, right? So we are happy. We we say it must be an A. We we write A here. And then we see one zero. Again, only one code word has one zero in the beginning. So it must be a B. And so on. Let's say I had this code. Will this same sort of algorithm work for this code for decoding? Some people are shaking their head. Can anybody explain? Yes. So, so the argument was that EA and C both encode to one one zero. Right. Uh, good. I'm just doing a few quick examples just to to like illustrate what's the main point. Let's say take this one, which is very simple. Okay, and let, let's just encode something. A B B A A B. So zero zero one zero one zero 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 one. Okay, can somebody tell me how I would decode this one? And can I decode it first? And if I can, then how? Right. Okay, so you see a zero. You check whether the next one is a one. So here it's not a one. So you say it has to be A, right? Then you see a zero, and then you have to look at the next one, and then you can decode. So this has to be a B. Was this okay? How, how we decoded this one? Right. <coughs> Did somebody notice that this one was a bit more complex than this one? Can somebody tell me why decoding this one was a bit more involved? Yes, you need to check the next one, right? So this was in a way, the word used is instantaneous. So as soon as you get to a point, you know whether or not you can decode and you immediately decode there. You don't need to look ahead one bit and like figure out whether what's this, right? Here, because you had zero, just looking at this zero, you couldn't even tell whether it's an A or B. You had to look at the next one even though the next one is not part of this, right? Like it's it's a next code word, but you have to like look ahead a bit. Uh, here you didn't. So good, okay. So, so for the next few lectures, we are going to stick to codes that are like this, and I will define what we mean exactly here. Uh, so so let, let, let's make it a bit, bit more formal. Actually, before that, let me ask a question. What's the big deal? Like, why are we trying to encode sequences? Why can't I just, like, I look at these four. These four are clearly distinct. Isn't that all? Like, like why am I even worried about encoding sequences? Can somebody tell me, like, like, like from a very intuitive level, like, in math, you, you read about bijective functions, one-to-one -one functions, right? This is clearly one-to-one. -one. Each of the symbols is mapping to a different encoding. Why isn't that enough? Why are we even like talking about all this? Can somebody guess? Like in a typical use case, why would you care about this sort of scenario? You can use last keyword for the uh, the Yes. Yeah, th th that's right. That's totally right. But but why are we worrying about encoding sequences? Why why is this not enough? Like I just look at this one, and I look at okay, a, each of these maps to a different sim different sequence, right? Uh, so so in an ideal world, 
not in an ideal world, but but really like in in another world possibly. What you could say is we have this code word, right? And the way I encode it is I put the first code word for a, I put a comma here, then I put one zero, I put a comma, one 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 comma one one zero comma one one one, right? Now with these commas in place, it's very obvious that this is decodable, right? All the three code words I wrote, everything is decodable with this sort of comma separated system. But but if you think about it, how how are you going to encode the commas, right? Ultimately, we want to store everything in bits. On a computer, everything is bits. There are no separate commas or anything. So so that's why we care because very rarely do you ever want to like encode just a single character. Almost always you want to encode big files, big sequences, big uh, network packets, whatever, right? So, so that's why we care about encoding these sequences rather than encoding just a single symbol. And when you are encoding sequences, you care about being able to decode it back without using any of these comma separators. Okay, so let, let me try to make it a bit more formal. So this is just a decoding algorithm, very simple algorithm. At every step, you take the next bit, you check if the next bit is a code word. If it is a code word, you decode and you reset and then you like go again. If not, you continue accumulating in your uh, candidate. So here, for example, step one, you have zero, it's a code word, good, you decode to A. Then you get one. One is not a code word in this list. So don't do anything. You just continue. Then you get one zero. You take one more bit. One zero is a code word B. So you decode. That's dash. Okay. Then you take one, not a code word. One one, not a code word. One one one. It is a code word D. So very simple algorithm uh, for, for decoding this thing back to this thing. Uh, okay. This might be like, if you don't know this, it might be complicated, but, but can somebody guess what property of this code makes this work? Yes, yes, yeah. So I guess you know, yeah. so can you, can you explain? Uh, Yes. Was that clear to people? Okay, L let, let me write it down and then we will make sure that our code is indeed prefix free. So prefix free codes or prefix codes, same thing, sometimes called instantaneous codes. All three, same meaning. Uh, they, 
no code word is prefix of another so here it's easy to check zero is not a prefix of any other code word right one zero is not a prefix of any other code word one one zero is not one 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 is not okay any questions till now and and, and we, we saw that prefix codes enable this very simple decoding algorithm one quick note we, we saw this code word code earlier 001 can someone tell me if it's a prefix code sorry some people are nodding some people are shaking their head can i get it Okay, so it's a suffix code in a way, I guess, yeah. But, but it's not a prefix code, right? Uh, because clearly A, the code word for A is a prefix for the code word of B. And uh, yet we saw, I don't know who, but somebody gave us an algorithm for actually decoding this, right? So prefix codes have this simple algorithm, but it doesn't mean that non-prefix codes can't be decoded. Uh, and we will see that it's a different property uh, called unique decodability. We will, we will talk about that later. For now, let's just stick to prefix codes, mainly because they are very simple and very soon you will see that they are enough, like any code you will use in life is likely to be a prefix code because they are, they are pretty powerful. Uh, we, will, we will see that for now, trust me. Good. So we have been talking a lot about this code. We decoded it. We, we are happy that it's decodable. Uh, we didn't actually measure its performance, right? We, we, we designed, we did all this work to, to beat the fixed length encoding. Um, and like if you, if you actually saw this, this input, you would ac actually think that this is worse because for some reason it has a lot of D, C, D, like where we use longer code words. Instead of two bits, we are using three bits. But, but on average, uh, let's, let's write down the expectation of, the length right so the average length or the expected length of this code um, okay can somebody help me calculate it just to make sure you are on track with the basic probability yes um, so it's the probability of ensuring that the x Right. So, so let me first write that down. So it's px times lx, right? Where x is in like the alphabet a, b, c, d, and right. So 0.49 times one. Times three. Okay. Thank you. So. So it's 1.53, we typically have a unit which is bits per symbol. And why are we putting this per symbol? Because later we will actually encode many of these together. So in that case, this we want to normalize by the number of symbols we are encoding. So it's 1.5 bits per symbol. So what this means is that if you have a long sequence, like if you had xn, uh, on average, you would encode it in 1.53 times n bits. Right. Whereas in like the old code, old I mean like the fixed fixed length code, you would use two n bits. Right. So we are saving basically twenty five percent uh, in terms of the the space. So, so compression for you. Um, right. One more point, uh, I think last time I asked like how much would you expect this to take like if you had an optimal sort of coding scheme and somebody said that we expect close to one bit per symbol just because A and B are basically all the probability, right? C and D are very small. So this is not one bit, it's 1.53 and this is not an optimal coding scheme and we, 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 over the next few lectures we will see how to get closer and closer to the one bit per symbol uh, or, or whatever the optimal is in this case. 
Okay, great. Okay, any doubts still now? We are sort of now moving on to a. Ah, n here is just uh, saying that, like, like for just for one symbol, you won't see this effect of saving. But if you have a long enough stream, like x n, so it's like x one, x two, x three, like you have a long input sequence of length n, then you would encode it in roughly one point five three times n bits. That's just because you are using so many bits per symbol, so you multiply by number of symbols. Okay. Let's look at another representation of prefix codes, which will come up again and again. It's a tree. So we have the root of the tree, like usual, and we have the leaves of the tree, A, B, C, D, and it's a binary tree. So every every node has uh, it's either a leaf or it has two children. Uh, the left one we label zero, the right one we label one. Uh, can people see a correspondence between that tree and this code? Right. Basically, the idea is very simple. You go from the root to a particular node, and the path you follow gives you the code word. Okay. Uh, can someone tell me what the prefix tree property means? In uh, sorry, the prefix free property or the prefix code property. What does that mean in the context of a tree? Yes. Yes. So. Prefix code equivalent to saying code words on leaves. So, for example, like this other code we saw earlier. Which had A here and B here. So, this is not a prefix code. Because a is not on a leaf, right? And the whole idea is prefix codes means that uh, no code word is a prefix of another. So if any code is like any any code word is internal, that would mean that that that's just not good because if if there was a code word here, then that's a prefix of B, C, and D, all three, right? Any code word here would be a prefix of C and D. Any code word, yeah, I think those are the only two internal nodes, uh, right? So is that concept okay? Yeah, sorry if it's very basic, uh, but I think we have to go through it, uh, right? I guarantee we will get to more exciting things. Okay. So this is the problem we'll be concerned with and like just people are generally concerned with in lossless compression. You want to minimize the expected code length subject to prefix free property or more generally subject to unique decodable property. Um, 
So in a practical setting, would you say this is enough? Like, is this the only goal you would have to minimize the compressed length? Or would you want your algorithm to have like other good properties? Anything else like in practice you might want from an algorithm? Performance, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is not the only thing we want in practice. Like we want speed, we want low memory usage, just, just general like computationally efficient algorithms. Um, and luckily a lot of the algorithms we'll see are also computationally efficient, so, so that's good. Uh, we will see a few which are uh, very theoretical and not at all practical, but they are also important to understand the concepts. Okay. So you can see it's an optimization problem. It's not like a good optimization problem. First of all, the lengths are discrete. So it's, it's a discrete optimization problem, which people who know optimization is typically hard. Plus this prefix V property is in quotes. Like, so usually in an optimization problem, you want a mathematical expression here rather than like this very ill-defined, no, not Ill, it's well-defined, but, but it's not like very analytically defined property. So, so we will we will fix those issues, and we will actually see a code that optimizes this, like it perfectly optimizes this uh, exact optimization problem. So that will be in a few lectures from now. For now, let's let's look at a few properties. Uh, So this is the first property of a good code. If x1 has higher probability than x2, then the code length of x1 should be less than or equal to the code length for x2. Uh, can somebody prove why this is the case? Like if this is my optimization problem, and this is, so why, why is this a necessary condition for, for the optimum? This is the first proof in our class, I guess. Yes, proof. So if not, you would swap the code words for x1 and x2, right? And since the probability of x1 is higher than probability of x2, you remember the, the expected length for summation px lx, right? So you always want higher p's to get lower l's, right? And, and clearly after you swap it, it's still prefix free because, because you just rearrange this number. So for example, if instead of this, somebody gave you a code which was like d here and d here, even though b has higher probability, you would just swap b and d and get a better code just because b has higher probability. So the expectation would go down. Uh, okay, is this property good? Okay, nice. Uh, property two. You can call it the negative log likelihood thumb rule. So this we will not prove for a few lectures, but, but this, this comes up a lot, so we will just state it for now. L of x is roughly equal to log base 2, 1 over P of x. So this is like the negative log likelihood that, that you might have seen in other classes. And uh, so we are just saying, this is much more than this, right? Here we just said higher probability, lower length. Here we are giving like a very specific characterization of what the length would be for a good code. Uh, and I'm very sorry, I will not prove this for today, uh, but but we will, we, 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 we will trust this for now. Uh, and Next lecture, we will we will actually see why this is the case. Um, right. It all boils down to that optimization problem. 
ultimately. So, so we will we, we'll, we'll prove this in terms of that optimization problem. Okay, let's test this rule. Does it even make sense? So let's look at the uniform distribution. So this is an example. So generally speaking, would you say that you, for uniform distributions, variable length coding is going to help me or not? Not at all, maybe a little, what do you say? So uh, let's say you're dist the, the, uh, let's say we are considering alphabet size of k. Okay, first, if k is a power of two, would you say say that variable length coding helps? So let's say k is uh, eight. So wh what would be the code length for me uh, for a fixed length code? How many bits per symbol should I be using for a uniform distribution on eight symbols? Right. So log k right which is 3 recall that here p of x is actually 1 over k so this is also log 1 over 1 over k right so thumb rule matching okay good yes now let's say k equal to 3 how many bits would you use in your fixed length code Two, right people say 2 so you actually use the ceiling of log k 2 again this is like close to log 1 over 1 over k right that's why we put an approximation here because in many cases this is not an integer so they can't be exactly equal uh, okay so for k equal to 3 would you say that variable length codes can help me or not Yes. Right. So if you had three symbols, you could have a code which is a fixed length code, which is like 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Or you could have, let's do 0, 0, 0, 1, just 1, right? This is also a prefix code. The second one is clearly better than the first one, right? So in general, like, yeah. Even for uniform distributions, you might benefit from variable length coding just because things are not integers generally. Logs of things are not integers. Um, okay. Any questions? So basically for uniform distributions, the thumb rule works. That's what we discussed just now. Uh, because the probability is just 1 over k. So log k is simply log 1 over p. Great. Okay. Okay. Any questions till now? We are going to see our first. Sorry. Yeah. So just to be sure. So when it is a power of two, the variable length encoding doesn't help us. Yes, it doesn't help us. We will prove it okay. in the next lecture. Yeah, we will theoretically prove it once and for all that it can't help. Uh, for now, we are sort of still trusting mm -hmm. things. Although for this, actually, you can sort of convince yourselves maybe. Uh, but but yeah, in general, like. In general, why is this true? I, I won't give any intuition right now. It's not really possible at this moment. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so we are going to look at our first uh, code construction. Uh, and this will be very important. Let's leave it here. Okay. I don't have a name for this code. It's called the Shannon code, but we also have another code, code which is called Shannon code. So if you don't know Shannon, Shannon is the person who basically uh, 
in a single paper in 1948, he introduced this entire field of lossless compression, lossy compression, error correction coding, uh, like, like the first paper that gave a mathematical characterization of the whole thing. So a lot of things in, in this course will be named after Shannon or like, or Shannon plus one other person sort of thing. Um, so let's just call it code achieving By the way, some of you might have noticed that we are using log base 2 everywhere, right? Can somebody tell me why base 2, what's so special about 2 here? Sorry, did somebody say bits? Uh, yes, 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 exactly, yes. So yeah, the 2 just comes because we are doing binary encoding. We are encoding everything as bits. If for some reason you were encoding as digits, uh, digits is like 10, so then you would be using log 10 and almost all, I, I believe all the results till now will hold exactly as it is for uh, log base 10 uh, or log base whatever. Okay. <clears throat> so we saw the thumb rule. Now we are going to present an algorithm that exactly achieves log, uh, uh, sorry, length of code word is equal to the ceiling of log 1 over px. Uh, okay. And then we'll do a few examples. We will prove that the code works. And uh, that will be good, okay. Okay, step one, compute L of X for all X. sort symbols in increasing L of X. And let's say we call them X1, X2, XK. So this is after sorting. With lengths L1 less than equal to L2 less than equal to L3 is then equal to LK. For each symbol, assign any, so each symbol, uh, let's call it XI, assign any Li length bit sequence that satisfies uh, prefix property. So it's a very greedy construction. You want a code you are given a probability distribution, you are given an alphabet. You first compute the lens, the lens that you want because you read this thumb rule, you know that this will be a good code. So you want to achieve this length, right? And you see that for higher probability, it gives a lower length. So, so, so it's, it's all good. So first thing you do is sort them in some order in terms of the increasing lens, okay? And then for each symbol Xi, you just find any bit sequence of length li that satisfies the prefix property. That's all. Okay, so is there any step in this proof that requires, uh, sorry, in this code that requires proof? Yes, so this one, right? Basically, can we even find a bit sequence of length Li, right? Uh, and we will prove it, don't worry. Uh, for now, let's do, do a simple example.
Can somebody compute the lens for me, please? If you have a calculator or computer. Lens are just given by this log one by px formula. So A. Anybody, please? Huh? Wow. <laughs> Yes, right. So, yeah, you can do a rough calculation, right? You know that if A was, if this was 0.25, you would get exactly 2. This is more than 0.25, so it's less than 2. So, ceiling will get you back to 2. This is also 2. This is 1 over 5, right? So, it's log of 5. So, after you take the ceiling, it's 3. Uh, 0.15, okay, I will trust. Okay. Five. Okay. Good. <coughs> and uh, you might recall we, we we earlier saw this prefix tree construction. So let's use that. Uh, so these are already sorted by length. So that's all good. Okay. So let's let's start making a tree. Uh, I want something at depth two for a. So let me go like this 0 0 let me assign this to a right so for the first one i succeeded in finding a length 2 sequence that's good for b can i find something is there any remaining leaf at length 2 yes so somebody said 0 1 right as you can see it's not unique right i could have given 1 1 also like i could have gone this way and given 1 1 to b but i didn't so there is some like uh, because we said any here, so it's not a unique construction. Okay, length three, let me do that one. So one, zero, zero, I give to C. For D, okay. Now E has a very long code word, sorry. Let me just give one, 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 one to E. Okay, so is this a prefix code? Yes, right, because all the code words are on the leaves, so it's a prefix code. Would you say it's a good code? Can somebody tell me? Do you like this code? Is this the optimal code? Why? Right, ideally you should be putting E here, right, not not here, but so, so this is a thumb rule, that's why we have an approximate sign here. This, this is not an optimum code, but we'll see it's very, very close to optimum and, and, and like all this theory will help us get to the optimum. So, so for now we'll stick to this, uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, okay. Okay, let's prove, let's prove that this always succeeds. We are always able to find the length li length sequence that pre satisfies the prefix property. So that will complete this code construction and show that we can indeed achieve this length. Um, <coughs> so in general, in terms of proofs, even if you have not done a lot of math classes, the proofs in this class are generally very simple and elegant. Plus, I think you're not going to be tested a lot on proofs in, in homeworks. Uh, we'll only yeah, we'll only do simple proofs basically. Uh, so I guess just enjoy, like some of these are very beautiful proofs. So hopefully you can appreciate them. Um, <coughs> okay. <coughs> okay. So the critical thing here is that the lengths are derived using this log formula, right? If you are just arbitrary lengths, you just had one, 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 one hundred times. Clearly, you can't find a code with every code word having length one. 
so so the the most important thing is that the lengths come from probabilities and the probabilities sum up to one so there is really you can't have too many short code words why because if you have too many short code words then you would have too many symbols with very high probability and then the sum of probabilities would exceed one which is not going to happen so so really the main fact we'll use is that the sum of probabilities is one um, <clears throat> so let's say okay let's first compute this sum 2 power minus l of x uh, xi i equal to 1 to k this is just sum i equal to 1 to k 2 power log 1 over p of i So here I use the fact that the ceiling is bigger than the probability. Therefore, 2 power minus ceiling will be smaller than the 2 power minus log 1 by p. Um, and now I can bring down the log. So it's just pi, which is just 1. Right. So summation of 2 power minus lx is just less than equal to 1. I will just call it li from now on. Okay less than equal to 1. Okay, let's keep this in mind. Let's call it 1. Okay. So we'll use induction for proving basically the idea is we will assume that up to step i we are happy and then we'll show step i plus 1 works. So at step, so the base case for the induction for those keeping track is that the, in the first, for the first symbol we can always find something and so the base case satisfies and then, then we'll just say that up to step i everything succeeds, at step i plus 1 what happens, uh, right. So let's note that summation, let's not use i, let's use m, i equal to 1 to m 2 power minus li plus 2 power minus lm plus 1 is less than equal to 1. This is simply because this was less than equal to 1 and this is like a partial sum from that. Rewrite this. Sorry, this will become clear in a moment why we are doing all this. 2 power lm plus 1 minus li less than equal to 2 power lm plus 1 minus 1. Okay. Let's call it 2. <coughs> okay, now let me ask you a question. So this is a basic tree, tree related question. If you have a node at depth three, how many, and now if you like expand its children tree, child tree, how many children at depth five will you have? So how many children at this depth will you have? So node at depth three, how many children of node depth five will you get for that node? Four, right here you can see clearly that it's four children of depth five in general node at depth d1 has fill in the blanks children at depth d2 
Yes, somebody says 2 to the d2 minus d1. Can somebody else justify it for me? Right, it, it's nothing special really, right? Like if you just started from the root at depth n, you have two power n nodes, right? So if you start at any particular depth, then if you go like d2 minus d1 below that, you will have 2 to the d2 minus d1. So, so nothing very clever happening here. Although you might already notice something here and here. We are seeing some pattern. So we are almost done with the proof now. Uh, L1, L2, L3. So you started constructing this tree. You started assigning these nodes, L1, L2, L3, right? Each of these nodes eats up, eats up a bunch of children at length, uh, depth Lm plus one. Basically, if you have this, this node is one of your code words, then all children of this node, everything here, this is a no-go. Because if you put any code word here, that would this one would be a prefix of that one, right? If you now look at this one, this one eats up a bunch. This one, this one eats up a bunch. So basically what we need to show is that after we did this L1 to Lm, which ate up a bunch of code, code words at depth Lm plus one, we still have something left. Uh, and this is exactly that. This is saying, see each each of those terms represent how many how many leaves at depth m plus one are are basically taken up, no, no longer available. And this is the total number of leaves at depth L, m plus one minus one. So basically, what this is saying is this is saying. at least one node or one leaf at least one leaf available okay so we are done basically this this is the proof all, all over uh, any any questions uh, let's make sure this is clear I can explain again if somebody needs. Yes. Right. So, so, so the, the main idea really is we are, we are designing a prefix code, right? So, so, so let's say you started creating a code and you assigned a code word here, A, right? Now let's say I want another code word which, which is at, which is of length 3. So, this one, if you look at this, it has basically four descendants at depth three, these four nodes. But once you assign this code word, all of these are no longer available because these are all suffixes of that. So if you want the prefix property, you can't have these as code words anymore. So the first m, like i equal to one to m, each of them ate up a bunch of space at depth m plus one. So now you want to show that at least like they don't eat, eat too much of the space, right? Because what you want to do is at, at step i or step m plus one, you want to assign any leaf, at least one leaf should be remaining, then you can assign. So let's do an example. I think that will make it very, very clear. We had an example. Okay. So let's say the lengths you want are one, uh, sorry, two, two, three, three, five. Okay. Actually, let's do a more aggressive so, sort of lens. One, two, three, three. Yeah, this will work. Okay. Okay, so one. 
first step works just works because at first step you can just assign the first you, you just have a leaf available all good right step two you need a node at depth two now you see that two nodes at depth two zero zero and zero one are no longer available why because they are suffixes of this guy but you still have these two nodes available right so at every step you need at least something to be available so here b is was b, you can assign b here all good now now we want two things at depth three so again all these guys are not available no 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 all the two children of b are not available however these two are still available so here you can now assign c and d so, so the way to think about it is that every step whenever you assign a code word it it eliminates all of its subtree and you and this counting argument is just showing that at every step even though each of those are eliminating a bunch of the subtree you can always find at least one leaf available uh, right so if i write it very carefully Actually, let me put a less than sign here because there is a minus one. So this term is number of descendants of ayat code word at depth L m plus one. And this term is total number of leaves at depth Lm plus 1. So what we are saying is that the total number of descendants is strictly less than the number of leaves. So there is at least one leaf left which you can assign to this new guy. Uh, yes. Okay. Let me give you a minute to absorb this. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Okay, uh, we will be happy to answer any questions later for now. So basically we showed that this length is this, right? Like all of this work is going towards proving that this is actually the right thing to aim for. Like the thumb rule is correct. Uh, and if you remember the optimization problem I wrote, it was that we want to minimize the expectation of LX subject to prefix property. So now let's formalize the prefix property in terms of an inequality, uh, which will help us proceed. Okay. So just a quick note, <clears throat> I guess this is about information theory. You will see that information theory, if anybody has done like computational complexity, you will see that lower bounds are very hard to prove. Impossibility results are very hard to prove. Proving that something cannot happen is generally very hard. You, you always need to like, like, it's just like all this P equal to NP and stuff are all stuck and nobody can prove them. Um, information theory luckily, has a lot of great tools to prove lower bounds or converses as we say which is that saying that something is just impossible so in lossless compression in the next lecture we will show that for any scheme in the world however like complex or like you can take million years or whatever you can't do better than this uh, 
Similarly, we'll see something like that for lossy compression. Uh, so, so this inequality is like sort of in that direction because this will help us prove in the next lecture that, that something is just impossible. Even the best scheme you can come up with in the world cannot beat something. Uh, Crafts inequality, okay. Given a prefix code with So it's a two part thing. First part is given a prefix code with lens L1 to LK, this inequality always holds. For any prefix code in the world, this will hold. That's the forward side. On the converse side, given any set of positive lens L1 to LK that satisfy this inequality, there exists a prefix code with lens L1 to LK. So in a way, you can think of this like as a characterization of prefix free property, right? This is a very nice mathematical way of saying that a code is prefix, like, like with this lens, the code is prefix free, uh, right? So for those who followed the previous proof very closely, can somebody tell me for what this, how, how to prove the converse? I think we erased some of the parts, but really, like, like uh, uh, I would, I would leave this as a homework because the proof of this is exactly the same as the thing we just proved. The only difference is that here our lens had a specific like formula log one by p x, but really the only property we used was that the summation this thing is less than or equal to one. After that, the proof never really used this fact. So, so this exact algorithm we just wrote will work for the converse. So the proof of the converse is uh, algorithm we already saw, right? So I won't won't talk too much about this because it's exactly the same proof, uh, right? So this is just saying that if you, uh, I give you any set of lens which satisfies this inequality, I will give you. I can construct a prefix code with these lens. Um, and the converse says that if it doesn't satisfy this inequality, then you can never construct a prefix code like that. So, so let, let, let's do a couple examples just to get comfortable with the concept. So let's say one, one, I just have two lens. Can somebody compute this sum for me? This craft sum as we will call it for now. What is two power minus L I summation for these? If if L right, so somebody says one, right? So two power minus one plus two power minus one equal to one. So now the converse tells me that since this is satisfied, it's less than or equal to one, I can construct a prefix code with these lengths. And clearly we can. We already saw that code, right? It's just it's just a trivial sort of A B code. Right? Slightly more complex example. One, two, Three, okay. Can someone compute it? Two power minus one plus two power minus two plus two power minus three. 
so this is 0 0.5 plus 0 0.25 right so it's less than one strictly less than one so i can construct a code yes uh, so a b c again is this a good code so i guess in a couple lectures or three lectures from now you will see that actually crafts inequality tells you whether it's a good code or not if if crafts inequality is not being satisfied with equality it's not the optimal code you can improve upon it and and the optimal code we will study will always satisfy crafts inequality with equality uh, right <laughs> let's do one more uh, just for fun one 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 right so it has three code words all of them have length one will this work no right and <laughs> you don't need the crafts inequality to show this but but really like you can check that this sum is 1.5 which is greater than one so you can never construct a code word with three code prefix code prefix code right like you can always like have this code zero zero so it's not prefix free you cannot decode it really so you can have these stupid codes but but really uh, you, you you can't have anything of interest with these code code lines. um but in general, this gives you like, like if somebody comes to you and says that, oh, I have constructed a code with these code lengths, you can quickly check with this formula whether like, they are making sense or not. Okay. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay, in the remaining time, let me quickly prove graphs inequality. Unless there are questions. Ah. Mm. So Kedar is suggesting I do a construct another code construction. Tough decisions. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, let me prove crafts today and we will do the construction next time. Uh, It's just so important. I, I think we should prove it once. Uh, and the proof is very simple. Like you will see, it's all, all these proofs are like similar sort of kinds. Okay. So, so we are proving the forward part. This part. You are given a prefix code. You want to show that this holds. Okay. So you are given L1 to LK. Uh, you are given a prefix code. Okay, let's say define L max, which is the biggest of these uh, L i. Okay. <clears throat> now it's a very similar argument to the one you saw before. So let me do it by example, just, just so that it's a bit easier. Let's say L max is 5. Why not? And uh, my L's are 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, let's say. So these are my L's. This is, this is my L max. And although we'll sort of prove it by example, but you will see it's just a complete proof. Okay. So let me spend several minutes to make a full binary tree of depth 5 uh, which I can't draw clearly okay so this is depth 5 okay okay now I will ask a question so I have this code word A. How many children, how many descendants of this code word are, are at depth 5? My code word has length 1. This is 1. So for a code word of length 1, how many descendants of that code word are, are at depth 5? 16. 16, right? We, we saw that formula before, if you recall. 
so it's just 2 power l max minus li so this is the number of descendants of code word i at depth l max okay so so this is sort of like the subtree of a and let's say my b is depth 2 here so b has a subtree do these overlap do the descendants of a at depth 5 or uh, this subtree under 5 can it overlap with the subtree under b is there any intersection at all why, why not what's the property we are using here right so that's just the prefix free property because if a and b had some common descendant you can show that basically like since b has higher depth than a right so a and b have common descendants only if b is actually in this subtree under a so then the code word for b is a suffix of the code word of a which which can't happen uh, was that clear i can repeat that right basically the idea is you have all these code words in a prefix code they are all leaves okay each of them induce a subtree under them infinite subtree really and each of them induce a completely disjoint subtree under them so what does that mean if i do this summation 2 power l max minus l i all of these are nodes at depth l max what is the total number of nodes i have at length uh, depth l max just the total number of leaves here yes somebody says 2 to the l max right in this example i have 32 nodes at depth 5 right out of which 16 are sort of taken up by the descendants of a 8 are taken up by descendants of b 4 are taken up by descendants of c and only one is by this guy uh, last one so does this make sense to people from what we talked about we said that each of these is disjoint right each of these has disjoint children at depth l max so thus their sum must be less than the total number of children at depth l max okay any doubts here it's nothing very complicated like if, if you think for a minute it's like very straightforward uh, uh, it might take I, I, I think the best thing I, I usually do is actually draw some of these for myself like take one of these concrete examples just draw it out right like if we do a smaller example we can actually draw it out let's just take a code word which is like one two three so you have let's let's first make a full tree of depth uh, three Uh, okay so this is my code word for a this is my code word for b this is my code word for c now the children of a at depth 3 are these four nodes so four are taken up by a basically so this is 4 b has two descendants at depth 3 c has just c is at depth 3 so it just has one descendant really so what we are saying here is that 4 plus 2 plus 1 must be less than or equal to 8 because 8 is the total number of nodes at this level so that's just this calculation here uh, and yeah now now if you see it's just you, you just cancel out l max on 2 to two, two the l max on both sides we are done yes right and yeah i think you will need to be patient for till the next lecture because in the next lecture you will see that how this we will use to actually show that for any prefix code in the world the best expected length it can achieve is something called the entropy uh, so and we will show using the previous construction that you can get arbitrarily close to entropy so basically entropy is the correct compression ratio should, you should aim for 
both in terms of like it's impossible to beat it and you can actually achieve it um, and, and, and this craft inequality will play like a critical role in that proof. The proof is basically just craft, craft inequality plus some convexity. Uh, yes. So I think I will stop here, answer any questions and then we will continue next time. Okay, I got a big stinker of a question. Okay.